So I was given an extraordinarily wide, if not impossible, brief, the study of development. And after wrestling with what I would say about that, uh, and indeed knowing what some of the other chapters were going to be about, I decided that rather than try anything like a survey of how development had been studied, or even a uh, historical story about the rise of the study of development, both with extreme interesting, I'm trying to look for a way of making sense of this at a higher level of abstraction. And to that end, my chapter identifies three important tensions, which it seems to me have characterized the study of development since its institutionalization in the period uh, since the end of uh, the Second World War. What I want to do is just say something very briefly about what, I, what these tensions are, just sketch them out, and try to say something about what has been happening um, since I wrote the chat, or what I might add to it if I was writing it again uh, today. So the first tension is a tension between what I would call general and specific knowledge. That is, a tension between generating knowledge and policy prescriptions that are generally applicable to a large class of developing countries, and generating knowledge of the successes and failures of particular countries at particular times. Now, on the one side, of course, as many of you will know, the drive for generally applicable knowledge in the study of development has been very strong. Think here of much of the Keynesian-inspired economics of the 1950s and 1960s, uh, the Washington <laughs> Consensus, ideas about good governance, and, of course, more economically uh, inspired things like growth theory or correlative growth projects. And, of course, you can see the attractions of that. Poverty and underdevelopment look like general problems, and there's a lot of it around, and that these general problems ought to have a general solution. Uh, there is also, of course, here we shouldn't deny it, an element of intellectual hubris, uh, inspired both by moral considerations, that is, something ought to be done about this general problem of poverty, and, of course, political considerations, how it is that large developed countries, particularly the United States, was to manage its relations with developing countries. On the other hand, of course, the other side of the tension, the study of particular countries at particular times has often identified specific, contingent uh, features and histories that explain developmental successes and failures. The most obvious cases here, of course, East Asian miracle economies, where indeed that tension between a general account, a general model, uh, or trying to capture the East Asian miracle experience under these general theories, uh, was only one side of it. The other side, of course, was more area-inspired, area studies-inspired attempts to try to pick out what was specific about the trajectories of these particular states. Now, the issue here, of course, is not just that some countries don't fit a general model. It is that the more we know about the successes and failures of individual states, the less plausible seem these general models, and the less likely it is that lessons can be drawn for other states. In other words, there's no denying that something like a developmental state is extremely useful for development, or has been extremely useful for development in a number of states. But the more we know about the political, historical, uh, social origins of the developmental state, the less likely it seems that any such thing could be simply transplanted to other places. The second tension is between what I would call generating knowledge of development in some very large sense, that is the transformation to something like industrial modernity, and generating knowledge to deal with the particular problems associated with underdevelopment, access to clean water, maternal health issues, infant mortality, uh, and so on. There's a tension here, that is between these two types of knowledge, because while both are undoubtedly important, the connections between the two are sometimes not especially clear. In other words, it's possible to have very significant growth and indeed processes of industrialization without significantly alleviating at least some of the problems associated with underdevelopment. And while development in some larger sense might be necessary to tackle some of these associated problems, we also know that some of these problems can be tackled and have been tackled in the absence of significant development in this larger sense of transformation to something like industrial modernity. And the final kicker here, I think, is that it's not at all clear that alleviating a series of specific problems, that is boosting literacy rates or boosting 
uh, life expectancy, improving access to clean water, improving maternal health outcomes and so on, will in the end add up to something like a transformation to industrial modernity. Or at least it's an open question. Can you stack lots of these smaller improvements on top of one another and get development in the large sense of that word? The third tension uh, is a tension, I think, between or, or revolves around the very evident disciplinary diversity found in the study of development. Development studies, certainly as it's called in, in, in Britain, is not a discipline, uh, it's a subject area. And within this, there have been very significant arguments and continue to be very significant arguments about two important things. One, which discipline is, as it were, the master discipline? Which is the most important academic discipline here in the study of development? And secondly, how the varied disciplines involved in the study of development are to talk meaningfully with one another. On the first of those, of course, the predominant tension has been between economics as a discipline, as the sort of master discipline in the study of development. Uh, in other words, development is primarily an economic problem with the other disciplines filling subsidiary roles, so politics helping to explain why countries don't follow the right economic policies, uh, or whatever it may be, or a more expansive understanding of the importance of things like area studies, anthropology, uh, as well as politics and sociology, to the study of development. And related to that, of course, it's hard for these disciplines to talk meaningfully to one another. Not impossible, of course, but it's hard. Partly because, of course, each discipline has its own, its own academic journals. We're all familiar with this in this room. Its own academic journals, its own conferences, academic departments, ways of getting promoted, the journals you must publish in, and so on. But, of course, importantly, these disciplines often have their own different ontological foundations and methodological uh, strictures. Getting them to learn from one another is hard, as, as I'm familiar with when certainly in my... University, everyone talks about the importance of interdisciplinarity, but it's actually an extremely difficult thing to do. As Rowley Campbell, one of the editors of the volume, has argued, there are significant barriers to the deep integration of the varied disciplines involved. <clears throat> so those, it seems to me, are three of the tensions which characterise the study of development, and it seems to me they're often very productive, right? they generate lots and lots of things, uh, but I'm not, even, I'm not entirely sure that they are resolved or possibly even resolvable. Let me just say very briefly something about where we are now. Obviously, because I, my argument, I would want to say that these tensions continue to characterise the study uh, of, of development. But I also think there have been some shifts, which I just want to just make a few very speculative thoughts. Um, some of which draws on an article I've just published in International Affairs with a colleague um, at work. On general versus specific knowledge, my first thought here really is inspired by a quote from a World Bank report written in 2010, where it said, a multipolar world requires a new multipolar approach to knowledge. And this points towards the broader sort of geopolitical and economic developments that we're all familiar with and that part of this conference is of course about, but as well as the recognition and increasing role that universities and think tanks in developing countries might play in the study of development. The case of China is, is emblematic here. Uh, it's followed a deliberate attempt of trying to boost its research capacity and its higher education system. Uh, three universities, if you include you know, Hong Kong, are in the top 50 of the global universities' rankings. Uh, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, just to take one example, has over 31 research institutions, 4,000, yes, 4,000 staff, and houses 80 academic <coughs> journals. Now, at one level, I think we might expect increasing amounts of research into development conducted in developing countries themselves to lead to more country-specific knowledge. That is, these are institutions designed to think about development problems in these particular countries. And I think that's probably likely to happen. On the other hand, research capacity in many developing regions remains chronically weak, um, and universities continue to suffer from a series of problems, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Second, even here, the temptations of generally applicable knowledge are hard for some people to resist. It's true that much of the debate about the so-called Beijing model or the Beijing consensus as some alternative to Washington consensus or something else, most of that debate's actually not originated in China itself, but for many, I think it is hard to resist the idea that China's <coughs> developmental success 
might have broader lessons for uh, wider developing countries. On development versus the problem of underdevelopment, some of you will already know this, but after chat was written, uh, a World Bank staff member, uh, Michael Walcott, wrote a blog post that much more pithily captured what I was trying to, trying to say. He said there was a contrast between big development and small development. Big development is structural transformation, and small development is focused on alleviating the material plight of individuals and groups. That's a much better way of putting it than I did. On that point, it seems to me that in some respects, big development is back, uh, notably in renewed emphasis on infrastructure, in the classic sense of transportation, public works, public utilities, communications infrastructure, and so on. Uh, Robert Zellick, when he was president of the World Bank, stressed the importance of delivering what he called transformational projects, projects which will transform economies rather than simply deal with the plight of individuals and groups. And if you look at the aggregate figures on, the, on infrastructure lending, infrastructure lending has grown very significantly over the last 10 or 14 years or, or so. Uh, and I think we can also see it in the revival, if you like, of kind of five-year national development plans that we've seen uh, in a number of developing countries, including in, in sub-Saharan Africa. It seems to me, though, that at least one question we ought to have here is the extent to which donors and indeed developing countries have learned lessons from past experiences. The experience of infrastructure lending in uh, the 50s, 60s and into the 70s is not very good. Infrastructure projects were often badly managed, poorly implemented, often downright wasteful, and the sustainability of, in of infrastructure became a crucial issue as the fiscal situation in many developing countries deteriorated in the 1970s and 1980s. Second, my second point here is that I'm not really convinced that we have any more substantial knowledge about big, how big development really uh, takes place. Infrastructure certainly uh, might be part of it. Development agencies might know more about how to deliver sustainable infrastructure projects, or at least uh, we have to hope that's the case. But that's only a really very small part of the story. Uh, and we mustn't forget that there are opportunity costs. If you focus on infrastructure delivery, there's an opportunity cost for both donors and developing countries. And about that, I think, we know very, very little. On disciplinarity and, and so on, I think probably even at the time I should have said something about this, but I'll say it now. Um, that is something about new actors and uh, new methodologies. On new actors, in terms of generating uh, research on development, um, the obvious examples are one very important set of examples are the large philanthropic foundations, um, like the Gates Foundation. Uh, the Gates Foundation has the largest endowment of any philanthropic organisation in history and has a spending portfolio which is bigger than the World Health Organisation. Uh, this is a major organisation. And its main emphasis is on innovation, and what they mean by that, I think, is scientific discoveries and technical solutions to uh, largely small development type of um, problems. And this points, I link to a second point about new methodologies, and I know Bruce mentioned it earlier on, the rise, uh, in particular, the rise of sort of the idea of randomised trials in development economics. Uh, in other words, that we need more rigorous, quantitative, experimental uh, forms of knowledge in order to make better progress in understanding um, the problems of development, most emblematic, of course, the work of the Poverty Action Lab at MIT. Now, of course, all that's been enormously controversial, uh, including amongst many economists. In terms of the tension that I talked about here, it seems to me there is a danger that these kinds of uh, methodologies expand the gap between the perceived hard social scientists and the perceived soft um, social scientists. Uh, even some economists who would think of themselves often as harder social scientists feel slightly threatened, I think, by these kinds of approaches. Secondly, these approaches are really only suitable for some development problems, important though they may be, things like vaccinations and so on. The complexities of the world make them extraordinarily unsuited to all kinds of important questions. It's not clear how you would do a randomised trial on uh, uh, the desirability of currency uh, devaluations. Let me just end by noting what I think is, is a paradox, or at least it seems to me a paradox. Um, there is a frankly dizzying amount of research going on uh, in, on development uh, in very many institutes and research centres around the world, and a, and, a, and a vast number of publications are produced every week 
on something related to the problem of development. So in that sense, the study of development is extraordinarily busy, thriving, uh, no less. At the same time, though, it seems to me at any rate that we can't help but reflect that despite all of this, we still seem to be quite a long way from having any really substantive, solid knowledge about how development, how it is that development is to be achieved. I'll leave it there.